My name is Ethan Moore. Uh, my uh, colorfully and explosively titled uh, presentation today uh, will be about our journey as a company um, when refactoring our um, core data processing service from Node.js to Scala. Yeah, so All right. Oh, now I can hear myself too. Okay, so uh, I'm the back-end tech lead for Big Panda, and uh, me and our CTO, Alec, we uh, refactored the, the, the service and were responsible for this project for the uh, past few months. And uh, let's see what we'll be talking about. Um, I'll do a quick overview of Big Panda. Um, I won't be plugging us too much, uh, but what we do, what our challenges are, and what led us specifically to Scala and Akka. Uh, I'll go over the architecture of our new process, the core data processing service. Uh, I should note that this would be a rather shallow overview, and we won't be delving too much into code, but there are some code samples, but feel free to hit me up later if you'd like to see some more details or uh, have some more questions. Um, and lastly, um, we've picked up a few useful lessons and patterns uh, when dealing with actor-based services that I'd like to display. And um, yeah, that's it. Let's get moving. There will be relatively little Node.js bashing, I promise, but I will spend some time talking about the disadvantages and why we chose to migrate off of it. Okay. So, uh, big panel. Th there is some time for questions at the end of the talk, but if anyone has anything urgent they'd like to ask, feel free to raise a hand. I can see you, and I'll let you ask. Okay. So, big panda. Big panda is the answer to alert fatigue. Why alert fatigue? We do. We make software for NOC teams. What's a NOC? A NOC is a network operations center. And why fatigue? If you've ever sat in a network operations center with all the blinking lights and the red alerts and the uh, monitoring systems, you would have known why it's called fatigue. Um, so what do we do? We integrate with various monitoring systems, IT monitoring systems, such as Nagios, which sends off alerts like your host is down or there is no free space on your, on your server. And we integrate with Datadog 2, uh, which sends metrics about the size of your queues and they're, they're overflowing and everything is banned right now. And we integrate with App Dynamics and various other alerting systems. And what we do is that we save you the trouble of having to deal with so many alerting systems. We take these alerts and we normalize them into a common structure, a common and simple structure. So for example here, the uh, Nagios alerts were normalized into two entities, we call them, uh, monitored items. Uh, one is describing uh, a ping problem on Rabbit 1, the other is describing a ping problem, a uh, disk problem on Rabbit 2, and so forth for the other alerting systems. We give them the big panda stamp of approval, and then we pass them through our correlation algorithm. What we do, what correlation actually means, is reducing your noise. So for example, instead of you having to see here or be alerted by two different alerts and uh, that are basically describing a problem across your RabbitMQ cluster, we will show you only one incident that contains or aggregates these two alerts. Same for the other alerting systems. So what this usually results for in most customers is a reduction of 95% uh, alert alerting noise. Uh, I'll discuss a bit later how we actually do that. So the thing is about these alerting systems is that they're, they're not quite um, uh, objects that send discrete events. They're actually event sources, if you're familiar with the terming and the uh, definitions of Aka streams, they're actually event sources that send a continuous stream of data that um, continuously flows and has uh, an implicit ordering, because there, there, there are um, actual timestamps on these alerts, and they 
uh, define the ordering in which the stream is, is ordered, sorted. So that's, those are event sources. And these other um, processing stages are actually uh, graph stages that do a transformation. So for example, we have a normalization stage and we have a correlation stage. Now, uh, I'm a big fan of seeing these uh, um, so-called business concerns. We have a business concern that uh, is required to normalize uh, incoming alerts. And we have a business concern that requires us to correlate alerts. I'm a big fan of seeing these business concerns reflected in, our, in the internal architecture or the interfaces. So that's actually a pretty good description of how our microservice architecture looks like. Um, I'll have a, an overview of that in a moment. So, um, given that, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize something important, that Big Panda is a real-time system. Um, why, why is that important? When an OC team is looking at their Big Panda screen, they expect to be alerted immediately whenever there's an alert coming from Nagios, Datadog, or AppDynamics. We can't tolerate any delays. Well, we can't tolerate a delay, but not a big one. Um, and we can't tolerate losing any data. So that's a thing to keep in mind. We'll see it um, bite us in a moment. OK, so the first challenge we were facing uh, last year is scaling to meet customer load like all startups. Um, this is a high-level uh, overview of our internal architecture. We have API servers, we have normalization servers, and we have correlation servers. The correlation servers modify the, the data in Mongo, and it's not shown here, but there are also uh, front-end uh, applications. There's a front-end application which reads the data from Mongo. So uh, what we use internally to route data between the services is RabbitMQ. Uh, so for example, um, an incoming alert gets routed into RabbitMQ. It gets routed then into another, uh, a different normalization server. After that, to a correlation server. The correlation server modifies the data in Mongo. And then it's routed out, out to a, another service um, through Rabbit. We use Rabbit extensively. So uh, the thing is that in order to do correlation properly, uh, this is an, an internal uh, uh, constraint. We have to, to process the data for a given customer serially. We can't do it concurrently. Well, we can do it concurrently if we use distributed locks, but that's not really concurrency. Um, so what do we do? Uh, whenever an alert arrives, we route it always to the same server using the hash on a customer ID. That's consistent hashing, if you know, well, if you know it. So for example, there are several queues attached to RabbitMQ Exchange. Each one contains data for several customers. And data for, for a given customer will always be routed to the same queue. And of course, um, the same ser there is only one server reading from a given queue at any given time. <clears throat> All right, so this works out pretty good most of the time. But the thing is that um, the sad reality about learning systems is that sometimes alerting storms happen. So what are alerting storms? Alerting storms are this yellow patch here. This is a real screenshot from our Grafana and our graphite monitoring, which you can see that around 3.30, there was a very big bump in one customer's data processing rate, which means that there is suddenly an inburst of, alertings, of alerts. And uh, the rest of the time, it's pretty quiet. The numbers, and I don't know if you can see them, but most of the time, alerting systems hover around 5 to 12 alerts per second. But sometimes, a data center switch goes out, and then you get a massive flood of alerts. And as they came, they disappeared. So what usually happens at this stage is um, I'm going to talk about how we, how we feel at Big Panda 
is that our queues start overflowing. I don't know if you can see that, but that's, these are our queues. We have um, 160,000 waiting messages in one of our RabbitMQ queues, and some more messages. And once we have too many messages, we get Nagios irritated. And once Nagios is irritated, PagerDuty is irritated. So that's not fun, and that's just me. The, the problem is, the real problem is, is the starvation for, for customers. Because right now, some of these queues are overflowing with one customer's alerts, but the other customers are getting starved out because all we're doing is processing this customer's alerts while the others are blocked off. So that's not fun, and that's hurting our SLA. Because once there is starvation, um, there are no auto shares. Auto share is a feature in Big Panda that allows you to receive alerts uh, through various channels. There is no processing. The customer's UI isn't being updated. Bad. This is not how an alerting system should behave. All right, that's challenge, challenge number one. Uh, challenge number two is an internal feature that we're rolling out uh, this year called Correlation Preview. Now, how does correlation work? I promised that I'd explain. So we do correlation based on matching rules. Matching rules are simply the, the logic of how do you correlate. So if I see um, a couple of alerts from the same host within four hours, I want to correlate those into the same incident. So for example, if we uh, put that together with two alerts, uh, all both describing Rabbit1 problems, we'd see, in Big Panda, one incident, as I've said before. So the thing is, um, this is a default rule. It's a pretty naive rule. It's a rule that we configure for most customers by default. Uh, but most customers, like IT people, they like to customize things. Uh, they want to see what would exactly happen if I change these four, this four-hour window to 30 minutes. Now, the thing is, most likely it won't be the same incident because the correlation window would be different and there would be different incidents that, uh, that should um, occur in the feed. So what we're basically trying to do here is process a sort of what-if scenario, or as we like to call it, we want to build a correlation time machine. What we'd like to do is see our incoming stream of alerts as an actual stream wherein there are alerts. Each alert has an offset, an immutable offset that will never change. And assuming that we're here at the end of the stream, we would like to get on our time machine and travel back through time to where our DC alert started. And then we would like to pipe that into our correlation servers and see what would happen. What would our incident feed look like given this different configuration that we've changed for the matching rules. So what this means is that first, we need to be able to replay data. Now, RabbitMQ, if you've ever worked with it, once you acknowledge an, uh, an, a message from one of, the, one of its queues, the message is gone. Second, we need, to be, we need this to be fast. Fast is not what we've seen up to here. And third, because, you know, once the customer is previewing data, we can't have him waiting 30 minutes for a preview. And third, we need this to be deterministic. Deterministic behavior is essential for this system to work properly. Why? We want the customer to see the same effect on real data as he's seen in this preview. We can't have it behaving differently every time. So these are our three attributes that were guiding us when we designed this, this system. All right, so let's see how the existing correlation solution looks like. So there are, this is only the correlation server. This is a Node.js based server. There are a few processing stages, all again linked by RabbitMQ. And a processing stage is essentially a Node.js callback that is subscribed on a RabbitMQ queue and it does some sort of processing to the data. It might do some I.O. on, we'll see in a moment, and it writes the result back to the next queue, and so forth, and, and that's how they communicate with each other. And as I've said, 
they all mutate data in Mongo, and, uh, and that's how the, the other services can see the results of the correlation. So uh, there are several problems and disadvantages that are inherent to Node.js, and we'll discuss them in a moment. But, but first off, the problem here is that there is no replay. As I've said before, the queues are ephemeral, and we have no way of replaying the contents of this whole processing uh, pipeline. Second, there is no isolation. Each processing stage is handling messages in a queue that, are, that, that belong to different customers. And as we know, Node.js is single-threaded, so once um, uh, a processing stage is handling a given message, it's not doing anything else. Second, yes, no isolation, we've discussed it. And worst of all, we have shared mutable state. You'd expect that these, process, these, these processing stages, which all operate semi-concurrently, they'd be modifying different data stores, but they're not. They're modifying the same data stores, and that obviously results in data races, which is not fun. And obviously hurts determinism, because data races impl implies indeterminism. Um, there is one thing that isn't listed here, but you can see from the overall coloring, and I, I forgot to mention it, but I'll use red, if you can somewhat see it. Uh, I, I'll use red to signify IO throughout the presentation. Um, there is lots of um, CPU time um, interspersed with IO. So we're basically spending a lot of time uh, waiting for, for IO. We're basically spending a lot of time context switching between IO, CPU, IO, CPU. Not fun. Um, this is how we would like the solution to look like. We would like uh, a consistent and unbroken stream of blue, which is CPU time, IO at the extremities, at the uh, outer layers, and only one um, stage modifying Mongo concurrently. So, um, there's one other co there's one constraint that this implies that I won't go into is that we now need to keep the correlation state in memory. A correlation state is basically a hash map of what incidents are currently open in a given customer's data set. Okay. So, some platform limitations for Node.js. First off, this touches exactly what I mentioned right now. The heap size of Node.js is limited to 1.5 gigabytes, which is quite unfortunate. And um, there's no way to work around this. You can obviously, uh, there are some libraries that implement native code and store data off heap, but those are very niche uh, libraries that are, from what I've seen, not very well maintained. Um, second off, it's single-threaded, which is not fun. This means you need to spawn several processes if you'd like to fully utilize a given machine, which has several cores and so forth. And that would be fine if Node.js had a decent clustering or inter-process communication framework. And of course, always fun, but quite subjective, there are uh, the joys of dynamic typing. Um, okay, so these are our problems with Node.js, and uh, let's see how our next solution is built. So we chose Kafka for the durable event stream. Why? It's quite obvious. Kafka is, is really the data structure that we're looking for that gives us the required semantics of an immutable stream that we can seek back and forth through. Um, we chose the JVM and Scala as a battle-proven framework and platform battle-proven platform for our distributed services. And we chose Arca as a computing framework. Now, I have to be honest, we chose Scala because of Arca. Arca is what sold us on the whole ecosystem as a way of, dis of constructing distributed applications that can scale and have the uh, required semantics of messaging and so forth. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. 
exactly. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, the question was, uh, more clarification, um, if, uh, if the, the, the fact that we need the, uh, the same server or the same process to always handle the customer's data mean that there is state involved. Yes, there is state involved, there is correlation state involved, and the fact that there is correlation state involved means that, only, uh, that we chose only one process to do this work concurrently, because we'd like this state to be kept in memory and not offloaded to uh, another data store, because that would be just lying to ourselves. Okay, so um, how would that look, this actor-based solution using Akka? So a node manager is just uh, an actor that we use to manage a given node. So, Obviously, self-explanatory. And uh, what we went with is a hierarchy that spawns an actor per customer. And we'll see in a moment why this is very useful, but every customer has his own actor, which represents a processing pipeline. This processing pipeline contains several stages. There is a Kafka reader, there is something that runs an algorithm, something that writes to Mongo, and something that writes to Rabbit. Each of these is an actor, and um, the fun thing about Akka is that there is excellent failure isolation, because if, for example, one, one of these fails or is handling immense load or so forth, it won't affect any other customer, because the failures are isolated to a given actor. Now, even better than that, if we, would, if we would like to tune the resource allocation, we can do that too using Akka. There are dispatchers that we can limit their concurrency. Dispatchers are uh, a wrapper around thread pools and, or executor services in Akka. And we can tune the assignment of each actor to, this, to different dispatchers and the resource allocation in each dispatcher. And this is excellent for quality of service. So we can guarantee the resources located to a high-profile customer or so forth. Now, um, just to relate these to the challenges, um, the just the fact that we're using Akka, uh, Kafka sorry, uh, allows us this restrainability. And, um, and uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. And, um, and and the isolation and the, and the, the, the excellent quality of service is, is afforded by the fact that we're using Akka. So the fun thing about this architecture, another fun thing about this architecture, this is if we would like to scale this to different nodes, there is Akka cluster for that. We can just spawn more of these in other JVMs and communicate between them using messages. And um, I, w I won't go too much into this because it's quite involved, but it was relatively simple to um, tailor a solution that can assign different customers to different nodes, different JVMs. Okay, uh, so th that's for the uh, overview of our architecture. And as I've said earlier, you can talk to me later if you want to know more details. So a few lessons learned. Um, okay, this one is not uh, tightly coupled to Akka or, or Scala, but it comes up a lot when doing data processing or stream-oriented services. Um, given the fact that we have an infinite data stream of alerts, that, that Kafka stream that we were talking about earlier, we should ask ourselves, how do we prune it? Because it grows infinitely, and we would like you know, to limit data sizes. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we actually chop off the events here? Now, the, na the naive solution won't work because let's, for example, assume that we've received two alerts that are out of order. We've received one alert that was critical. The other after it was OK, but in reality, they occurred in, a, in, in the reverse order. But we just received them out of order. So if we would just chop off that tail for the stream, we would, we would be actually missing alerts if we read that stream from the start. So the sad fact here is that streams that result in state, because we're processing the, the stream and, and, we, and we construct the, the correlation state, this requires state recovery. So how do we do state recovery? Well, what we came up with is simply snapshots. We, every, um, 
um, 50,000 events or two hours, for example, we take a snapshot of the correlation data and we just dump it into the snapshot repository. And when we're booting or when we're seeking back, we load the snapshot and within the snapshot we've noted which offset it has seen from the stream. So we know where to seek to and we know which offset it's safe to read from. Now, um, due to the fact that this can get quite big, uh, this, this can get, um, I don't know, a given customer has, might have 7,000 incidents, that's a tree structure that contains even more objects. Um, we need some sort of way to, rep to serialize these, um, these snapshots. Jeez, you can't see anything, huh? <laughs> uh, these snapshots uh, in a way that's both compact and seeing as compact means binary, we need some, some way to handle schema evolution. Because if we're uh, adding a field, we, won't, we don't want our uh, process to crash when we deserialize the, uh, the, the snapshot. So what we've used is cryo or chill, because the, 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 the point here is that most people at this point would jump to protobuf or avro, because those are serialization formats that um, tout their schema evolution support. But we found out that we can write our own manual serializer and deserializer using cryo and chill, and support schema evolution with a few caveats. And uh, it's quite compact. Big data sets are only a few megabytes in size, which is pretty good. Deserializes and serializes pretty fast. And um, it's pretty easy to deal with. Um, so uh, the key takeaways from this point is, one, you have to use snapshots if your streams result in state. And two, JSON or Protobuf or Avro are not the, are not the right solution. Always. Not always the right solution. We use JSON a lot. OK. Next up is uh, a nice pattern that we've identified uh, when doing these sort of pipelines of actors. So um, the thing is, that we would like to benefit from asynchronous I.O. But we can't have the uh, rabbit writer uh, processing a batch that hasn't been uh, finished processing by the Mongo writer. So what we do is basically a really old trick in computer science called pipelining. Um, when we read a batch, we pass it forward to the algorithm, and by that time, the algorithm runner is processing it, and the Kafka reader is reading another batch, and so forth. Now, how do we deal with failures here? Now, well, the fun thing about Akka is that you can use behavioral traits to, um, to share behavior, to implement behavior. So what we've done here is implement a behavior trait that wraps the receive handler of, uh, of the Akka actor, and um, simply retries processing uh, a, a, um, a received message, a message batch, in the actor until it succeeds. And if it persists in failing, it will uh, cause the, uh, if you remember there is a, a pipeline actor that is responsible for all these actors, it will cause the pipeline actor to restart all of the pipeline. Only that customer's pipeline, of course which is pretty good because most failures, as we've seen, are pretty intermittent. For example, Mongo is under a certain load or Rabbit is under a certain load. This is an intermittent failure that will probably pass in a few moments. So once that has succeeded, we can continue forward with our processing. Um, now, I've included a... Uh, can you see anything? No, all right. It will be available on the slides. Um, it's, this is just, uh, just to see, uh, this is the amount of lines that is required to make use of the behavioral trait implementing retrying. You just wrap the receive handler with a, uh, with a method and it implements retrying. So the key takeaway is, is to capture common actor behavior using traits, but you have to make sure they compose because if you're trying to mix in several traits, as is always the problem with multiple inheritance, it doesn't always compose. Okay, next up 
deferring and controlling stage mutation. Now, this is how it looked like before. Everything was modifying Mo Mongo concurrently, and this obviously causes race conditions, which is not fun. What, we've, what we came up with, came up with uh, is a way of decoupling the processing from the mutation. So this is a common trick in functional programming, where you separate the pure parts of your program that, has, that have no side effects from the impure parts that have side effects, that have state mutation. And what this actually means is that the Mongo writer is sort of an interpreter for instructions that are outputted from the algorithm runner, of, and when it processes these instructions, it knows how to mutate Mongo. Now, the fun thing about this architecture, and this is again a sample of how these instructions look like, uh, I'll just describe it. There is a trait called instructions, instruction. An instruction has an ID, an, an incident which is supposed to mutate, uh, and um, there are several instructions all extending this trait, create incident, update incident, and so forth. So here's a list of instructions that are outputted from the algorithm runner. Now, how do we process these instructions? Well, it's pretty simple. We just fetch the ID from Mongo, we apply the, the, the uh, instruction, and we set it back. Um, but if you um, stare at this for a few moments, you will see that it's actually crying out to be optimized. Because we can actually look at this a bit differently. Instead of processing it instruction by instruction, or slow by slow, uh, we can uh, rearrange the instructions to look like a chain of instructions by ID. So, this, so what we actually do is rearrange the instructions in a map, keyed by ID, and the values are a list of instructions, and then we can, in one pass, fetch all of the, um, uh, all the relevant incidents from Mongo. We can apply all of those instructions at once in memory, and then we can set the latest version back to Mongo. Now, the only way this is possible is that other services or other, um, there are no uh, other concerns which need to see the intermediate results because we're processing an, an, an instruction batch. This instruction batch is supposed to be atomic and there is no reason for anyone else to see the intermediate results. So why even write them back to Mongo? Just write the actual results back. Now, um, the, 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 the excellent thing here is that this bumped our processing rates from 300 events per sec to 1,600 events per sec. This is a major improvement, and it also quite reduced the load on Mongo because instead of you know, getting and setting and getting and setting and getting and setting, we're just getting it once, multiple data we can batch it to, modifying everything in memory and setting it back at once into Mongo. This, this has proved very beneficial. All right. Um, so the key takeaways here is that you should try as hard as you can to decouple the state mutation from the actual processing. And the benefit you get from that is that you can optimize this, that state mutation when interpreting the, the, the results of the processing. Okay, last one, measuring. Uh, Conrad discussed that earlier, um, but we've seen that using drop wizard metrics and metrics Scala, which is a wrapper for drop wizard metrics, these are both libraries, uh, we can very easily uh, create metrics, uh, and again, you won't see anything. These are uh, a couple of timers that are all measuring uh, execution of different code paths. So for example, I'll, I'll read some of it. There is a timer that is responsible for the read latency for Mongo, a timer that is measuring the write latency for Mongo, and the timer that is, that is measuring the overall latency. Now, if you'd like to use them, all you need to do is just wrap a few statements of Scala in a block using those timers. You can see the, uh, the actual, the actual uh, way it looks like in the presentation. Um, and then uh, Drop Wizard Metrics takes care of using these metrics and then shipping them off to where, wherever you'd like, be it graphite, graf um, 
uh, Ganglia, I think it supports, even JMX. Very, very cool. So the key takeaways are instrument away everything you can. And then you get fun things like these awesome graphs that show you at real time how your uh, system is, is, uh, is performing based on latency or any other thing you'd like. Okay, so the final numbers and benefits. First off, the rate improvements. We've improved from 16 events per sec on a single Node.js process at peak to 1,600 to 2,500 events on a single pipeline. That's the group of actors that is responsible for a given customer at peak. And this is just one customer. We've tested and this can scale uh, a lot more. We haven't ha had the opportunity to test this more than, I don't know, 15 customers or 20 uh, customers. Uh, but, but this can obviously scale much more, mostly due to the fact that we're not limited by I.O. One of the biggest optimizations that I showed you has very much reduced the load on, on our I.O. services. Now, um, another, another benefit is the increased isolation. We now no longer cause starvation whenever a customer is, being, uh, is going through a, an alert storm. And it's much more scalable. Um, the last and somewhat underappreciated benefit is the determinism. Now, um, Conrad earlier discussed um, tracing. How do we trace transactions? How do we de debug um, co big call graphs, like messages being passed from, from actor to actor that we have no trace of? What we've seen is that the fact that, that things are determined, deterministic is that we can simply download the data to uh, someplace else, replay it locally, and then you can debug it. This has proved to be amazing for debugging. Uh, anytime we've seen a bug in production, uh, we can simply download the Kafka topic, replay it locally, and the same bug will reproduce. Why? Because it's deterministic. All of the, all, every, everything that the system is doing is completely determined by the contents of the Kafka topic. And that's it. I'm ready to take some questions. Yes. I didn't hear that. Just wait, wait for the mic. <laughs> Why not to use Scala Z streams or Akka new streams? Because basically you build graph, you build pipelines, you build everything from your own, and everything basically is ready for this. Yeah. So when we started, Akka streams was still experimental. So uh, I know it's just the API, but we uh, didn't like going into uh, something that's clearly labeled experimental. And uh, we tried to uh, keep it simple. Um, it's, it's, it sounds like, like a lot of code, and it sounds like a complicated architecture, but in, in reality, it's much more simpler than you think, because you know, it's just an actor passing messages back and forth. There is no need for back pressure, because we've solved it using batching and pipelining. So we si back pressure was a big concern, but we sidestepped that. And um, if I had to write it today, Restart the project. I'd use Akka streams, um, but we were simply put off by the fact that it was, it was labeled ex experimental. And Scala Z stream is a big learning curve, and we were new ways. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, you talked about your journey, and I actually have the question about your title and the journey from No to Akka and Scala. Uh, one what caused originally no to be chosen? And second, if you would build it now from scratch uh, at the resources you probably had at that point in time, would you choose still Akka or would you still repeat the journey? Uh, well, Big Panda uh, has been running from since when? 2012. Now, Node.js is a very good platform for prototyping. You can get services that are pretty complex up and running in no time. Um, to be honest, I think it's a pretty personal preferences, uh, preference. I wasn't with the company at that time, but I'm, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't say. If, if time is really pushing, I don't know. I might, I might choose a, a dynamic language. But at this stage where we need the services running to, uh, in, in a battle-proven platform, 
um, that can scale, this is no-brainer. Either that or Erlang, I don't know. It's, we built something different but similar, and uh, we didn't choose Node.js for exactly the same reasons you did, because it's, good for you. it's great for edge yeah. systems, it's not good for data processing, so. Uh, yeah, uh, what, what I feel about Node.js is that it's good for, for moving that data between places, not very good for things that are memory bound or CPU bound. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Now, one last thing, uh, we're hiring, so if you, if you like what you've seen here, shoot me an email at, at this address, irovid.bigpanda.io, and I've uh, dropped here a grocery list of libraries that we've used, and uh, beca because the thing I spent a lot of time is researching the different libraries and what should I use for JSON, what should I use for, for Rabbit. So we just dumped here the uh, libraries that we're using. We're very satisfied with them and um, enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>